our screen. Yes, um, please. Okay. Yep, that um, would be great. Okay, Sebastian, do you want me to do that? Or Good morning, uh, everyone. We're gonna let our um, guests work through the technical mm. issues of sharing the screen, but welcome everyone who's joining via YouTube. It is Wednesday morning, Health Healthcare, and we're gonna get started. We apologize, we're a little late. Um, so we have with us today, the Department of Financial Regulation. This is classified under mm. our Education 101. Uh, testimony we've been having. And so here, what the Department of Finan Financial Regulation does in relation to health care, health insurance, they do many, many other things. This is focused on health insurance. And while they are still going through, I think if you're okay, Emily and Sebastian, we're going to do some quick introductions in the room so you know who you're talking with, and then we'll turn it over to you. Great. Sounds good. Great, so Art, you wanna start? Yeah, Rep. Bob Peterson from Clarendon, represent Rolland District 2, uh, Clarendon, Wally, Food, West Rockland, and a piece of Rockland Town. Uh, Leslie Goldman from Wyndham 3, Rockingham, um, Westminster, and Brookline, Bells Falls region. Mari Cordes from Lincoln, and I take responsibility on the legislative side for the pharmacy benefit manager bill. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows Mari. Uh, Topper McFawn. I represent Barrytown in a small piece of Williamstown. Uh, Lori Houghton, City of Essex Junction. Alyssa Black, Northern Essex. Alan DeMar, Enosburg and Montgomery. And we do have a member online on, uh, in the Zoom room. So Daisy, do you want to introduce yourself? Good morning. This is Daisy Rebecca, and I represent Winooski. Uh -oh. nope. Great. Um, thank you, Daisy. And um, thank you for joining. We will have members coming in again. Everyone's just, um, I think, asking some last minute questions over at the legislative briefing. And I just want to note, because um, there's some of us who are back in the committee, Emily Brown was not able to join us today. So we have Emily Kosicki. I hopefully I said that right. Um, and Sebastian, I'm sorry. Art Duango. Thank you. <laughs> so if you two want to go ahead and introduce yourselves and we'll kick it over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Sebastian Arduango. I am an assistant general counsel at the Department of Financial Regulation. And um, I'm joined today by Emily Kosicki, who is our director of policy. Um, even though my job title is assistant general counsel, I basically do all things healthcare at the department um, with the deputy commissioner Brown. <clears throat> so the department's role in health insurance is actually pretty broad. Um, Emily, can you go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> yes. And can everyone see my screen okay? <clears throat> yes, we can, thank you. Okay, great, perfect. So um, Vermont statute defines health insurance pretty broadly. So it's insurance against bodily injury, disablement, <laughs> death by accident or accidental means, um, or the expense thereof, or disablement or expense relating from sickness. <clears throat> Basically, the only thing it does not include is workers' comp, which is its own universe. Um, so when we think of health insurance, there are two broad categories. There's what we call major medical. Um, you'll hear this term come up a lot, um, but it is a term of art that we use to describe um, comprehensive healthcare. <clears throat> that is healthcare that covers inpatient, outpatient, and pharmacy services for a period of usually one year or more. <clears throat> we also Sebastian, Sebastian, I apologize. Can we just pause for one second for people in the committee? If you want to follow online, it is under today's date on our committee page. Refresh it. You might need to refresh your page. Just sorry. Oh, yeah. sorry. Just Thank you. Oh, no problem. Oh, yeah. So we also regulate Medicare supplement insurance. And um, Medicare supplement, you can think of as an add-on to Medicare parts A and B, which we'll often refer to as original Medicare that covers services that original Medicare 
doesn't cover. And there are a bunch of different Medicare supplement plans um, that are dictated by the federal government insofar as what the insurers can offer. And um, all of those plans and um, issuers are regulated by DFR. Then the last big category of health insurance that's regulated by the department is what we call limited benefit or short term insurance. And this is another term that you'll you'll hear a lot, even though it is you'll find it in in some statutes, but it is not um, it is not like up front in chapter 107 with a definition. So um, short term and um, limited benefit plans are either, as the name implies, um, plans that cover a specific thing, like um, there are what we call dread disease policies that only kick in if you um, contract specific diseases or um, hospital indemnity policies that only kick in if you incur a bill of more than say a thousand dollars at a hospital. Um, then there are short term policies that will sometimes have the same scope of coverage as major medical, but are limited to say three or six months. And the purpose of those policies is for instance, if you're between jobs and um, you just, you want to have health coverage um, until you start your next job, um, that's what a short-term plan is for. And then there are things like um, dental and vision insurance that um, are for historical reasons not included in major med policies. So those services are typically um, standalone. Um, can you go to the next slide, please, Emily? So when we're talking about um, major medical insurance, we are talking about a handful of entities in Vermont that provide that kind of coverage. So <clears throat> there are entities like Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, MVP Healthcare, and Cigna, which are insurance companies that provide full insurance coverage to their subscribers. Then there is Medicare, um, which by way of reminder for those of you who are new, is the government healthcare program for the aged and disabled, and also um, those who have um, end-stage renal disease. Then there's Medicaid, which is a, again, by way of reminder, um, government healthcare program that is a state federal partnership um, for um, those with lower means. So Medicaid is a means-tested program. Um, then um, employers provide health insurance. And um, while some employers um, purchase a fully insured policy for their employees, other employers, and we call these self-insured employers, um, directly pay for care out of pocket. And um, you might recall from your presentation with the um, Joint Fiscal Office that um, self-insured employers are regulated by the federal government under a law called ERISA. So um, when we're talking about um, the distinction between fully insured um, Vermonters and self-insured Vermonters, um, what we can do as a department um, will <clears throat> almost always have an impact on the fully insured population, but there's very, very little we can do um, with respect to the self-insured population because um, all of those folks are um, have their care regulated by the Federal Department of Labor since it's in theory an employee benefit that's directly paid for by their employer. 
then um, to round out the the major players that we see in Vermont, um, insofar as major med coverage, there's um, Tricare, which provides health benefits for members of the military and their dependents. And then there is um, the Federal Employees Health Program, which in Vermont is administered by Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> so our regulatory objective with respect to health insurance is twofold. Um, we want it to be both affordable and available. And this means that we want premiums to be low enough that uh, Vermonters can afford coverage, um, but we want also the insurers to have sufficient reserves to meet their contractual obligations. And we also want to ensure that there's competition within the industry and to protect consumers against unfair and unlawful business practices. So um, because of the bifurcated nature of major medical health insurance uh, regulation in Vermont, where um, the department uh, is the entity that is charged with ensuring solvency, while the um, Green Mountain Care Board is in charge of um, reviewing rates. Um, our primary role with respect to um, health insurers in Vermont is to ensure their solvency. So um, when, when we're talking about um, premiums, um, that's, that's not something that DFR does with respect to um, major med, although we do review the policy forms and um, we do all of the um, market conduct and consumer protection work for those entities. All of the um, rate and premium review is done at the Green Mountain Care Board. So Sebastian, I'm gonna stop you there because I see some questioning faces, yep. <laughs> Joe. I'm uh, curious about how you work with the Green Mountain Care Board, because one thing I'm curious about mm -hmm. is, you know, if your job is to um, ensure solvency and the GMCB's job is to ensure rates, those are obviously highly interlinked concepts. And so I'm wondering how your department works with them to ensure that the rates they're set will ensure solvency. Yes, so um, every year as part of the rate review process, um, we send the Green Mountain Care Board a solvency memo. And the memo will, will typically say that the rates that are um, offered um, by the insurer, so the insurer will first file rates, um, will typically say that um, those rates will promote the company's solvency and caution against um, cutting that rate in, in such a way that would uh, threaten that solvency. Um, every three years, we also undertake a review of um, the risk-based capital for our insurers. And um, risk-based capital is basically a way of measuring the overall solvency of an insurer. And um, we make that report um, public and um, share our findings with members of the board. So that, that's how we provide um, our view of the insurer solvency to the, um, the care board um, with respect to the rate review process. Um, just to follow up on that, um, so, uh, uh, you know, we've heard testimony, also seen in the news that, um, you know, the insurers have requested a certain rate um, and the uh, Dream Mountain Care Board has given less than that rate increase. Um, I guess my first follow up question, and I have two, my first follow up question is um, when you made the recommendations or, or excuse me, you went, when you sent the solvency memo to the Green Mountain Care Board, did you say that the 
requested rate increase was the one that would ensure solvency, or did you say that the rate that Green Mountain Care Board ultimately settled on was the one that would ensure solvency? When we're sending the solvency memo to the board, we're looking at the requested rate increase. Great, and, and um, have you seen since, uh, you know, it, it seems that's not uncommon for the Green Mountain Care Board to uh, provide less than the, the requested rate increase, have you seen the Green Mountain Care Board's decisions have an impact on overall solvency or have you felt that despite them not uh, giving the full requested rate that insurers have maintained sufficient solvency in Vermont? Yeah, that's a good question. I think overall insurers have maintained sufficient solvency in Vermont, but it is for reasons outside of the rate review process. Um, for instance, um, both Blue Cross and MVP have a portfolio of securities that they uh, that they have that are part of their reserves. And since the <clears throat> the stock market overall has performed reasonably well over the last couple of years, um, their reserves have gone up, um, even though that's not like they did any better in, in terms of their core business. Thank you. Does that make sense? It does, yes. Good question. Art? Yes, uh, uh, Sebastian, you, you mentioned on the slides, and I didn't get all of it, but something about competition. And that's one thing I'm concerned about when it comes to insurance and our health system. Uh, what did you mean by that? And can you expound on it a little bit as to where there is competition in our insurance uh, situation of Vermont? Yeah, that is a great question. So um, the answer depends on the market. So in the um, fully insured major, major medical market, um, we have two competitors, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont and MVP Healthcare. And um, even with those two competitors, um, we've been able to see that, um, for instance, um, MVP has tried to um, you know, aggressively uh, lower their premiums or, or have lower premiums than Blue Cross Blue Shield. And then the, the next year, um, Blue Cross has tried to respond to that. So um, even though the, the number of competitors in the um, fully insured major med market is, is small, there is still, um, I characterize it as, as fairly robust competition between the uh, the two insurers. In the um, Medicare supplement market, um, there are a number of <clears throat> different competitors, um, which we will um, will go through in another slide. But um, I would I would characterize the um, the competition in the med sub space as exceptionally good and. Uh, if you are shopping for um, a med sup policy, uh, you're, you're going to get a great deal in Vermont because there are a lot of insurers competing in that space. And then with respect to the um, limited <laughs> duration or um, limited benefit plans, um, there's also a lot of competition because there are a number of uh, national insurers that um, try and offer these products in all 50 states. So um, if, if you're looking for a, a short term plan, there, there are a lot of options if you're if you're shopping in Vermont. In a follow up to that, Blue Cross Blue Shield and, and MVP are the two. Are we open to other insurers coming in and competing with them? Uh, yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I, I think from our perspective, we would be thrilled if, um, say, Cigna wanted to jump in to the um, fully insured um, individual and small group markets, uh, because uh, as far as we're concerned, the, the more competition, the better. Okay, and so we, there's no barriers to other companies coming in that we, we throw up then? 
Yeah, I, I would characterize the barriers to entry more in terms of um, like trying to put together a an adequate provider network more than um, okay. any regulatory barriers imposed by the state. That, that's really the biggest barrier for a new health insurer that wants to establish itself in the Vermont market. Okay, thank you very much. Looks like we have one more, Leslie. Good morning and thank you. Um, I'm just curious to know if this relationship that, you know, you write the memo in evaluation of the insurer, insurer solvency, and then the Green Mountain Care Board evaluates, makes their decision. Is this a typical model nationally or is this unique to Vermont? How does that fit in? No, this is this is unique to Vermont. So um, the Green Mountain Care Board was created by Act 48. And the idea was that um, the board would review uh, health insurance rates for just a, a short period of time uh, until the state transitioned to single payer. So that never happened, but the, um, the board has stayed in its role um, in terms of the um, rate review regulator for major medical. Um, so this, this, is, this is a completely unique uh, situation to Vermont. Oh, if I could follow. So do you think that this model is a good model for Vermonters, that they're more protected maybe than those in other states or not necessarily? How, how would that fit? Um, that is that is a good question. And I, I, I can't say um, whether it is it is good or or bad. Um, I. I will say that um, we work very well with um, the Green Mountain Care Board and that um, the rate review process in terms of um, you know, having all of the, the filing material um, being public and um, having a public hearing and a, a lot of opportunity for public input and comment is is probably one of the more robust that you will find in the country. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sebastian. I think we can continue. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> so um, one of the other functions that the department has with uh, respect to health insurance is company licensing and um, the company licensing section does not only um, licensing, but routine financial analysis and exams for all of our domestic and foreign um, and alien insurance companies. And um, just, um, just in case, um, this is new to you. Um, when we're talking about foreign and alien insurance companies, we're just talking about insurance companies that are domesticated in other states. Um, so we have six domestic health insurers in Vermont. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, obviously. Uh, the Vermont mm -hmm. Health Plan, which is a subsidiary of uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, Vermont Blue Advantage, which is another subsidiary of Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, WellCare, Delta Dental, and the VHI Trust. Um, so WellCare and um, Vermont Blue Advantage are entities that are created to offer plans in the uh, Medicare Advantage market. Delta Dental, obviously, only offers um, dental plans and the um, VHI trust only offers plans to um, employees of school districts. Um, in addition, we have 343 um, foreign issuers that are licensed in Vermont. And um, like I said, a lot of these issuers are um, national or regional entities that um, try and offer, for instance, the same um, cancer plan in all 50 states. 
And then we have one um, multiple employer welfare arrangement or MIWA. And a MIWA is a, uh, an association of employers that are in the same line of business that um, offer insurance collectively. So um, the one MIWA that we have in Vermont is the Auto Dealers Association that um, as part of what the association offers to their members, they, um, they can offer um, a fully insured um, health insurance plan um, just as if they were a large employer instead of dozens of different car dealerships um, all over the state. So, uh, Sebastian, we're going to stop there. I have a question and then Joe yeah. has a question. So, and Topper has a question. So where does MVP fall in here or do they not? MVP is a foreign um, health okay. insurance issuer. They are domesticated in New York. Great. Uh, Joe and then Topper? Um, just it's a follow up on that question. Uh, so do we have sort of full regulatory ability over foreign and alien plans? Um, yes. And are, are there any alien plans in Vermont? So um, there are I know alien, alien means other plans. countries. There are, there are alien <laughs> There are there are companies that are domesticated, for instance, in New York that operate in Vermont, like okay. like MVP. But we have um, full regulatory authority over those plans, um, just as if Blue Cross had issued them. The one key difference between a domestic insurer and a, a foreign or alien insurer is that. Um, we rely on that insurer's home state regulator to um, do the substantive review of their solvency. So going back to health insurance rate review, we also issue a solvency letter for um, MVP, but it is typically much more bare bones than our sub our uh, solvency letter for Blue Cross because all we're doing is going to the um, New York Department of Financial Services and asking about MVP's solvency. And because Vermont is such a small chunk of MVP's overall book of business, it's, it's usually the case that nothing that happens here um, will affect their overall sub solvency. And this might be a Green Mountain Care Board question, not you. And if so, just feel free to defer. Um, but when we have these foreign um, health insurance plans, how do do we have a rate review power over that, or can yep. or they just okay? Yeah. So like, they can't like rate said, um, the, the the plans are all regulated as as if they were like offered by a domestic entity. It's it's only the solvency review that is different. Great. Thank you. Stop it. Uh, Sebastian, um, how about these new uh, in, uh, insurance companies that are done by the tech companies? How does that mm -hmm. fit in here? Like Amazon? Like Amazon, yeah. Yeah. So um, big companies like Amazon and, and increasingly smaller companies too um, are self-insured, which uh, again means that they pay for their own employees' health care out of pocket. And um, because the, the process for doing this is all governed by federal law, um, this is the um, ERISA law that I was referring to earlier, um, there's, there's very little that we can do as a state to um, regulate this 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 is the the regulation of um plans that are um offered by amazon or um apple or, or global foundries to their employees that all happens at the federal level and um i i will say that um i, I have been keeping track of um some of the things that Amazon is trying to do, especially in the um, the pharmacy space. Um, but it's it's more out of just 
from keeping up with the industry as opposed to um, any kind of regulatory um, interest. So Sebastian, if Amazon had a health plan that I was interested in, am I wrong? Are they selling uh, insurance plans to people like me? No. I, um, not? No, they they are. If if they are, they they are not doing it. Um, um, in accordance with the law, because if Amazon wanted to offer insurance to you, they would need to um, get licensed and um, follow all of the regulatory requirements that are required of any other um, health insurer. Thank you. So Sebastian, to follow up on that, I have a couple of questions. So you're following it from the perspective of what's happening in the industry. Would that be something that uh, you, someone at DFR would flag if, um, let's say Amazon or another entity wanted to start selling insurance directly? Yeah, absolutely. Is there anything that comes before the legislature? How does that work? Yeah, so um, if if a new insurer wants to enter the market, and I'll, I'll use um, WellCare as an example because um, they came into the market um, fairly recently um, to offer um, Medicare Advantage and Medicare Supplement plans. Um, they'll typically get in touch with our company licensing section and then um, ask what they need to do to become a licensed issuer in Vermont. And what WellCare did was to, they created a like a Vermont based subsidiary, um, but um, an entity like Aetna that is domesticated in another state could just um, get a an out of state license. And um, once all of that was reviewed by company licensing, um, they could begin offering products in Vermont. Um, there, um, so the, there is there is a process and we, we try and make it as um, as public as pro possible, like what the process is, uh, so that if if a new competitor is interested in entering the market, like they can do that and hopefully, you know, start offering products within a year, maybe two, of um, reaching out to us. Okay, and then I have a follow up, and then we have a couple other questions. What about, and this may not fall under DFR, what about the potential for, say, a drugstore chain to open up clinics within their brick and mortar space that anyone could come to? Is that a regulatory under you or is that in a different area of our government? <clears throat> that it depends on the um, size of the clinic, but is it is not under the um, Department of Financial Regulation. Um, um, I I would defer to the um, Green Mountain Care Board about what the requirements are for the certificate of need um, process, which is how um, new healthcare facilities are approved. Great, thank you. So Alyssa and then Art. Um, just a really quick question. Do you have a publicly available listing of the 343 foreign life and health insurance that are licensed? Yes, we have it on our website. Okay, thank you. I will dig a little deeper. <laughs> yes, and if, if you need a direct link, we can we can get that to you. I, I, I understand that our our website is is kind of a maze. <laughs> <laughs> if you could send a drag link, that would be great. That would be great. Art? Yes. Uh, just a question uh, on this, like, company license. 
I assume that for someone to, to operate here, an insurance company, that they must provide um, coverage for all the lists of things that we've seen in other slides. I, I, I know there's a they cover. They, they've got to cover the basic uh, things plus some that, that we've added. Is that, how does that line up with other states, especially states around us? I don't know if that's clear or not, Sebastian, maybe I'm. Yeah, up. so um, as, as I understand the question, you're asking how um, Vermont's mandates, um, for example, requiring insurers to um, cover experimental um, cancer treatments um, compared to those of other states. And yes. um, I think that our um, mandates are generally comparable to um, what we see in the other New England states um, and also New York. Um, of course, every state is a bit different. And I think the National Conference of State Legislatures has a chart on their website uh, that compares all of the uh, health insurance mandates of the 50 states. So um, if you're interested in a much more um, comprehensive review than I can provide off the top of my head, I will um, track that link down and um, send it to you. Uh, th that's not necessary. I, I would just ask if, if you had people wanting to work here, wanting to, to enter our market, say that, no, your requirements are too tough. I, I mean, I, that's all. I, just a general question. Yeah, right. I, I would say that our, our especially our, our company licensing requirements are no no more strenuous than those of um, the other states in our region. Thank you. Great, thanks Sebastian, we can keep going. Hmm. So um, outside of rates and forms, um, or outside of um, major medical insurance, um, we review the rates and forms for all of the um, MedSup and um, short-term and limited benefit plans. And um, this is governed by our accident and sickness minimum standards reg and also by um, chapter 107 of title eight. And in general, um, the uh, standard of review is that the rates are not unjust, unfair, inequitable, uh, misleading, or contrary to state law. And this is the same standard that the, the Green Mountain Care Board uses when reviewing um, major medical rates too. Right, next slide. So um, now we are out of the nitty gritty of um, licensing and rates and forms. And- um, Sorry, no, we're not. Sorry, Sebastian, we're not oh. out of it yet. Joe. Okay. <laughs> Just like forms, did you mean like actual forms or is that a term of art, like an actual like fill in the blank form here? Is that a term of art here? Yeah, so um, when we're talking about forms, we're, we're talking about a, it is a, an actual form that the insurer fills out on a system called SURF, which is the system for electronic uh, rate and form filings. And um, this, um, this form basically tells us um, what kind of product the issuer wants to offer and what all of the specifics are in terms of of coverage. So, uh, for instance, for a, a dental insurance product, it would it would tell us um, the the maximum coverage is a thousand dollars, and uh, these are the specific services that it covers, and these are the exclusions. 
Um, so when we're when we're talking about forms, we're talking about those forms on surf. Thank you. Now we can move on. Thank you. Okay. So um, outside of rates and forms and company licensing, we have um, a number of other regulatory roles. Um, the two most important of which are um, consumer services and market conduct. So um, in consumer services, we have a, um, a great team of three um, consumer services representatives that um, take consumer complaints related to all lines of insurance, including health insurance. And that's how we figure out what is going on in the market. So if, if we get a number of calls saying the, the same thing, like I, I have a problem with my insurer, they're not covering why, um, then we can go to that insurer and ask about that. And um, if it's serious enough, then we will undertake what we call a market conduct examination, which is where we basically um, go through and look at all of the claims um, related to why service and um, determine whether um, the insurer has complied with um, our rules and laws pertaining to health insurance. Um, the other big consumer services activity that we do is health insurance external appeals. And um, what those are, are um, it's a service that's required under the Affordable Care Act. So all 50 states do this. And it allows consumers to um, seek external review of um, adverse decisions made by their health insurer um, if the decision is based on a determination <clears throat> that the um, healthcare service at issue is either not medically necessary or um, excluded because it is um, experimental or investigational. So um, if you're a consumer and you, you have coverage denied for one of those reasons, um, if, if your insurer says that um, you, you can't get genetic testing um, to see if you have an aggressive form of cancer, uh, covered because it's not medically necessary, then you can come to the department and um, we will send it to an outside expert for a review. And this is, this is a doctor in the same field um, who is unconnected to either the patient or the insurer. And then um, that reviewer's determination is binding on the insurer. So if the external <laughs> says it has to be covered, then the insurer has to cover it, but if they uphold the uh, insurer's decision, then the uh, the patient still has all of the legal rights they otherwise would have. Like if if they want to if they want to sue their insurer, they they still can. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we also have um, a number of smaller regulatory roles. So um, under Title VIII, we are the primary enforcer of um, federal laws relating to healthcare in Vermont. So we enforce the Affordable Care Act and the No Surprises Act, uh, the latter of which went into effect in January of 2022. Um, we also license and regulate third-party administrators. So um, third-party administrators are insurers typically, but also other entities that administer claims on behalf of usually um, self-insured employers. So um, if Global Foundries has its um, self-insured employee health plan, they won't administer all those claims themselves. They will contract with a health insurer to administer those claims, or they'll sometimes um, contact contract with a smaller entity that administers those claims. So um, 
we regulate um, those entities that that just exist to um, administer claims or um, tax advantaged health savings accounts for <clears throat> um, for health plans. Um, we also regulate healthcare stop loss insurance, and um, this is a kind of insurance that is offered to self-insured employers that basically says that um, if your health claims for your self-insured employee plan that you're paying out of pocket are above a certain amount, either um, per employee or in total, um, this coverage will, will kick in and it limits the uh, employer's exposure um, under their health plan. So um, we, we set those limits as part of our regulation of healthcare stop loss. Um, we're also involved in a, um, a number of grant projects from the centers from for Medicare and Medicaid services. Um, so for those of you who are new, um, two years ago, the department received a substantial grant from CMS to study um, different facets of our market. So um, we used part of those grant funds last year to um, update our essential health benefits benchmark plan, which is basically the, the plan that all of the other plans are based on. And um, through that process, we were able to um, require coverage of hearing aids um, without any um, legislation or additional cost to the state. Um, so that, that was um, part of what we used the money for. And then um, we also have two other projects going on right now. Um, <coughs> that we're using the grant money for with respect to mental health parity and um, medically tailored <clears throat> or medical nutrition therapy. Um, so we are, we're excited to, to have that federal money to um, do this work. Um, we also regulate um, the intermunicipal plans. Um, so here we're, we're talking about VHI and the, the League of Cities and Towns. Um, we um, are responsible for um, issuing the community rating formula, which um, tells insurers how they can rate their plans. Oh, excuse me, I'm just gonna hang up my phone. <laughs> Um, and then um, under Act 131, um, we have authority for all of the new PBM regulation that just came into effect uh, this year. And um, finally, we do a lot of reporting. So um, health insurers have reports to file under Act 152 and um, Department Regulation 0903. And um, we make those reports available to the public on our website. So um, we, we do a lot um, with respect to healthcare. So um, I think at this point, I, I am prepared to, to take any questions about any of the 12 or 13 different things I just spoke to you about. <laughs> Thank you, Sebastian. And I, you know, for the new members, um, DFR is always a pleasure to work with and they do do a lot um, for us as a legislative body, for our healthcare system, for our health insurance. So thank you. We have a couple questions. I'm gonna take the liberty to start and then we'll do Topper, Leslie and Art. Can you talk a little bit more about what you're doing around the mental health parity and specifically when we might see some analysis? Yes, so um, with respect to mental health parity, um, we've engaged um, with our grant money an outside consultant that 
is um, going to help us develop a more consistent process for um, catching mental health parity issues at the form review stage, um, as opposed to um, when we get consumer complaints. So um, just to, to give you an example of the kind of thing that we'd like to catch earlier. Um, <laughs> last year, we learned that um, one of our insurers um, was requiring um, prior authorization for all um, inpatient mental health stays um, when they did not require the same for um, inpatient physical health stays. Um, so, um, you know, we'd raised that issue to the insurer and, and they corrected it, but it, it's a practice that had been happening for, for some time. And that's the kind of thing that um, we think we can catch earlier before it affects any consumers. So um, we just started that work. Um, we just had the, the kickoff meeting with our um, contractor um, last week. So I would expect to have um, written product by the end of the year. Great, that's very important. And I'm um, thankful that you're starting that work. A quick question, will it involve looking at parity with rates or does are you just looking at the forms and what is offered? <clears throat> yes, that is, um, that is one of the things that we're going to look at too because um, We've, we've known for a, a little while now that there is um, there is a disparity um, between what mental health providers are reimbursed next to what comparable uh, physical health providers are reimbursed. And um, when we've talked about it with the insurers, um, they have said that um, it, it is um, typical for um, providers with, with say like a different level of education to um, get reimbursed differently, but um, it is, this is an issue that, that we're going to examine in, in more depth using our grant funds. Great, thank you very much. Topper? Uh, Sebastian, DIVA plays a major role in deciding whether specific services being provided to somebody are medically necessary. What role do you play? Do you, do you play any kind of look, you know, collaborative role with DIVA or how does that work? Are they just doing it all on their own? Yeah, so um, you're raising an excellent point. Um, so uh, DIVA, the, the Department of Vermont Health Access regulates or is, is the entity that manages Vermont Medicaid. And um, we have no authority over their process for determining whether a claim is medically necessary or um, whether a claim or a service requires uh, prior authorization. All of that is, is set and reviewed by DIVA. Um, we only have authority with respect to um, the fully insured products and um, just ensuring that um, consumers can seek external review um, for those medical necessity or <laughs> experimental or investigational determinations made by insurers. Okay, thank you. Leslie? So I'm interested in community of, you mentioned the community rating formula. I, yeah. yeah, and I don't understand, I've heard it mentioned of course all the time, but I don't understand how it's calculated and what constitutes community um, in, in this work. And I don't know if there's a simple way to think about it or maybe not. Yeah, I, so the simple way to think about what the community rating formula is, is the, it's the, the rule that sets out like who is in the community. So um, <clears throat> for instance, one, one issue that we recently looked at was um, let's say that 
there are, uh, you have a family and the, um, the kids are purchased, the family is purchasing insurance for their kids, but not for themselves. Let's say that they have um, insurance through, um, through their employer, but the employer doesn't cover dependents. Um, the community rating formula is the, the rule that says um, whether those kids count as individuals or whether they are a family in terms of um, the, the coverage that you're buying on the exchange. So um, in, the, um, in the case that, that we looked at, we determined that under our community rating formula, um, two kids um, in the same family that were buying insurance apart from their parents were individuals as far as um, what their what their premium was going to be. Um, so the family was, was going to buy two individual plans as opposed to a, a family plan. And I, my recollection is that that actually worked out to be um, less expensive for the family. Wow. So um, I guess I'm stuck on the word community. Yep. Like who is community? In the, it's, so it's not like the state of Vermont is a community. It's the insure, the, the cover, people covered by an insurance company that is considered the community. Or yeah, if it's, if it, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time. Yeah. Cause it, um, it's yeah, I, I can follow up right? offline, but it's, it's, all of the people in the the rating pool so like everyone who is right. who is under 67 and then we have um different rules about like who can buy like, like individual an individual plan or a couple plan or a family plan with the, with the key difference being like a a couple plan just covers two people while a, a family plan covers everybody in the same household. I think we'll stop there and you can take it offline, Leslie. Art. There's multiple communities, I guess. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Many communities. Art? Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, a few slides back, you mentioned you had a list of all of the uh, healthcare providers in the state. One of them was, was TRICARE, which handles the military. And I've heard, I've, I've had people get a hold of me uh, to say that getting access, finding folks that cover TRICARE insurance is difficult. And I wonder what role, if any, you folks play in making sure that um, an insurance company of Vermont has enough uh, spread that folks can easily access that care. Of that yeah, so um, we call the we call an insurer's the spread like or how many providers they have um, network adequacy, and we do play a role in making sure that the provider networks of uh, health insurers are adequate in terms of um, making sure that every insurer has. Um, providers within a certain time and driving time and um, physical distance of everybody in the state. Um, but we don't play that role with respect to, um, to TRICARE. And I believe that there are um, regulations in place that require um, providers to accept Medicare to also accept Tricare at the uh, at the federal level, but I think I I would defer all of those questions about what what federal law requires to um, insofar as as um, providers accepting uh, Tricare to ledge council. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Great. Any other questions? 
This was extremely helpful and we appreciate all the good work that DFR does on behalf of Vermonters. So thank you both Emily and Sebastian and I'm sure we will be talking to you soon <laughs> on something. So have a great thank day. You. So we are a couple of minutes early. Is is our is Jordan in the Zoom? Okay, do you mind starting early and then we'll just take a little longer break if we have time. That would be great. So we are going to continue on the health insurance topic. And here from MVP, we'll give an overview of what they do here in Vermont. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield was not able to make it today, so we'll have them come in at a different time. And please move the food basket art. So oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> time for breakfast. <laughs> right, exactly. So uh, can you let Jordan in? Would be great. Jordan, are you here? Good morning. I am here. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I apologize. I, I just got disconnected the minute I joined, so I wasn't. Oh, no, playing. no. And, and we're a couple minutes early, so hopefully that's okay. Actually, we're going to blame it on Claire because she said it was okay. Um, so all. we're... We're going to do some introductions here on the committee so you know who you're talking with, and then we'll okay. turn it over to you for introductions and to go through your presentation. So okay. we'll start with Alan. Alan DeMar, representing Enosburg and Montgomery. Alyssa Black, representing Northern Essex. Uh, Lori Houghton, City of Essex Junction. Tropper McFarland, representing Barrytown and a piece of Williamstown. Oh, Leslie Goldman, Windham 3, Rockingham, Westminster, Brookline in the Bells Falls area. Art Peterson representing Clarendon, Wallingford, West Rutland, and a piece of Rutland Town. And we do have uh, someone online, potentially. She's homesick, Daisy Borbeco from Winooski. Just so you know, there is someone in the Zoom room as well with us. So, Claire, do you want to kick us off or however you want to do it? Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, well, good morning, everyone. My name is Claire Buckley, and I work um, at the lobbying firm Leonine Public Affairs here in Montpelier. And you, some of you who were on the committee last year may have known my business partner, Chuck Starrow, who retired. Oh. Um, and so I am um, going to be working with MVP this year and wanted to be here in person to just, so, you know, you could see me and um, I'm in the building. So please reach out with questions or if you need anything from MVP. Uh, I'm the point person on the ground. And Jordan... Um, who is on, in the Zoom room is really going to give the presentation today. Okay. Uh, but right. I just thought I'd be here in person. And, and we appreciate that. And as Claire said, she's in the building. So she's definitely who you can reach out to if you have any questions. Yeah. Wonderful. And my understanding is the presentation is on your website. Great. Sure. All right, Jordan, we'll kick it over to you. Great. No, thank you, uh, Chair Houghton and members of the committee. And, and good morning. Can everyone see my screen? I'm attempting to share it on my end. Yes, we can. Okay, great. So I really appreciate the opportunity to join you this morning and, as Claire mentioned, provide an overview of, of MVP, who we are as a company, and um, our, our Vermont business. And at the risk of embarrassing myself at the outset, I'll, I'll just note that yesterday as I was finalizing these PowerPoint slides, I don't know if anyone has ever noticed this feature, maybe it's a new tool, um, but PowerPoint has a new coaching function, so I thought I would check that out and... Um, the one piece of feedback uh, PowerPoint gave me is that I was a little monotonous. So I, I guess, <laughs> bear, bear, bear with me this morning. I'm going to try to be as exciting as possible. <laughs> we appreciate that. All right. So, Good luck. So kidding, thank you. Thank you. So kidding aside, uh, MVP Healthcare, who are we? Um, for those of you not familiar, we're a regional community focused, not-for-profit health plan uh, headquartered in Schenectady, New York. We were originally founded in 1983. <laughs> Mohawk Valley Physicians Health Plan. So we started in the capital region of New York and over time our footprint has expanded to encompass, as you can see here, all of upstate New York and Vermont. So as a, as a health insurance company, as a healthcare company, we currently support and provide coverage to about 600,000 customers across that footprint. And our current workforce includes about 1,500 employees located across um, one of four primary office locations 
including a Williston office location, which I think we have about 20 uh, employees on the ground there uh, to date. So MDP, uh, our mission, vision, and purpose, just starting here, you know, we, everything we do is really rooted in a local community focus. And that's something we take very seriously as an organization. You know, fundamentally, we believe that everything we do should be centered around our members. And that drives a lot of, you know, how we organize ourselves and how we conduct our, our business on a day-to-day -day basis. So our mission is to improve uh, health and provide peace of mind. And really importantly, that's kind of the fundamental purpose, the fundamental uh, element of our business is to ensure that our members will have access to high quality health care and that their health care needs will be met. Our vision is to create healthier communities and to do this through innovation and collaboration. And our purpose, importantly, is to find a better way to help you, the patient, the member, achieve your best health and well-being through innovation. So this really is um, focused on using data and you know, soliciting feedback and input from, from members and community partners and providers to identify unmet needs and then to work on, on products and services and supports to meet the needs of those members and address those gaps. And while our mission, vision, and purpose, our, our North Star as an organization, um, you know, we, we use our core values to, to kind of help us get there. And really, again, these are all uh, centered around the member and the member's experience. Uh, core values are to be the difference for the customer, to work every day to earn their trust, uh, to be curious um, as an organization, as a workforce, I think healthcare is constantly changing. It's, it's, it's complicated and we recognize to kind of move the healthcare system forward, improve the, the experience for our members. Um, you know, we have to kind of challenge the status quo and constantly ask questions as an organization on how we can do things better. And then importantly, something we take very seriously is, is being humble and that MVP is a, a, a large organization. As I mentioned at the outset, we've got about 1,500 employees, but relatively speaking, compared to large national companies, uh, for-profit uh, health insurers, and, and some of our local health system partners, you know, we are a, a small organization by comparison. So we really have to be efficient in, in terms of um, you know, providing the, the, the handling the work that we do. And that includes really, tr really focusing on not being a top down or siloed organization and recognizing that, you know, good ideas come from anyone within the organization and of all backgrounds and walks of life. So that's uh, bringing solutions and ideas to uh, the table that can help us, um, you know, advance our mission, vision, and purpose and better serve the needs of our members. So on this slide, I'm just gonna start here. Uh, this is an overview of MVP's book of business because I think it, it aligns nicely with just a general um, overview of who we are as a community-based health plan. And what this chart shows is how our members, the roughly 600,000 members are distributed by product and market type. And this includes across our footprint in both upstate New York and Vermont. And on the left-hand side, you can see about 60 to 61% of our members are enrolled in what we call government programs. So that is, those are healthcare programs funded by either the state or the federal government where the government sets the rules and the benefits, uh, the program parameters and certain objectives they're trying to achieve in the programs. And they partner with a managed care company like MVP to provide that coverage and try to advance those, those aims. Um, New York is a little different from Vermont in that New York's Medicaid program, it's state government programs which again include Medicaid, child health insurance program, uh, dual Medicaid, Medicare eligible enrollees. And we have another state program here called the Essential Plan. They do all of that through managed care. So about 50% of our enrollees are actually in New York state government programs. We have another 11% in Medicare Advantage, which is obviously a partnership with the federal government. Uh, the other, uh, the remaining slice of our business is in what we call commercial markets. And that includes the subsidized commercial markets, which are the uh, Affordable Care Act regulated markets. So these are individuals buying coverage on their own. They don't have employer sponsored coverage. Uh, this includes small groups. You're buying through Vermont Health Connect or the New York State of Health here in New York. And we also provide coverage in the, uh, the commercial markets, the large group markets, which include both fully insured and what we call administrative services only, but uh, you all will probably hear it more often referred to as self-funded plans or ERISA plans. So those are group plans where we, as, as the insurer, don't own the risk, but we are provided ser providing services such as maintaining a provider network, credentialing providers, paying claims, uh, issuing ID cards, and so forth. 
Great, Jordan, if you don't mind, we have a question. Yes. Hi, Jordan. Thank you. This is Alyssa. Um, I was wondering if you could explain to us the relationship between UVMMC or UVM Health Network and the Medicare Advantage um, yes. product. And yes. also, are, are, I'm curious, I mean, because you, I know that MVP has had a Medicare Advantage plan for some years. Um, where, was everyone in Vermont moved to that particular plan or are you still, is there still the option to purchase the non-UVM Health Network plan, at Medicare Advantage plan, if you reside in the state of Vermont? Yes, I can, I can speak to those real quick. So the, the relationship with the University of Vermont Health Network uh, in 2021, uh, we entered into a collaborative partnership with them to launch, uh, co-create and launch a physician-led, um, co-created Medicare Advantage product. So I think 2022 was the first year that product was offered in the marketplace. So we're in year two. Um, I think all of the, as you mentioned, MVP has been a Medicare Advantage for, for some time, including in Vermont. And I believe that we've retired the, uh, everything is, is under the UVM Health Advantage brand at this point, but I can confirm that. I believe every, everyone is enrolled in, in the, in the co-created program at this point. We have, are you yeah, I'm good. Mari. Thank you, Jordan. Um, I wonder if you can help us, especially for um, those of us that might be a little bit newer to this part of the healthcare world. Um, I think that the terminology around Medicare can be really confusing, mm -hmm. uh, Medicare and Medicaid. Um, Medicare Advantage is um, does not have a public fund um, like Medicare, like Medicare itself um, has a Medicare fund. <laughs> Medicare Advantage um, is really a, a, a private, not a government, even though there are um, <coughs> maybe some regulatory involvement from the federal government. It's really, uh, uh, to me, that's a little confusing. It's, it's not like a government program like Medicare. So the, from where we sit, we view it as a public-private partnership in that the, the, the plan itself is largely funded through uh, public program dollars. So what the federal government would otherwise pay for the average cost of a Medicare enrollee, for example, go into the premium that's paid to a managed care like, plan like MVP to administer, to provide a Medicare option, right? There may be additional premiums on top of that, uh, depending on the, the plan selection you choose, but fundamentally the, the premium is what we call a capitated premium that is, that is paid out by the government to us. Uh, it's same, same kind of concept in uh, New York's state government programs where again, the state is the, the payer, if you will, and they've contracted with us to provide the benefit. Now the distinction between Medicare Advantage and state government programs per your question is that Medicare Advantage is an option, right? It's one. It's one route through which you can get your, your Medicare benefits covered and managed, whereas in New York, our state government programs, that is all done through managed care. The state has effectively said, we want the managed care companies to help us uh, manage the program on our behalf. Does that make so, sense? So I want to clarify what I'm hearing, because the terminology is awkward, I think. So Medicare Advantage, you are receiving funding from the federal government Medicare, yes. and then the advantage piece is you might buy the event, you would buy a privately, a private insurance on top of that. So that is, the distinction is Medicare Advantage is uh, what's known as Medicare Part C. So within a Medicare Advantage plans, you get your Part A benefit, you get your Part B benefit, which is, so Part A is hospital, Part B is your physician services and part D or part D, which is prescription drugs are often all rolled into one part C plan. So it really is your Medicare benefits provided through a managed care option. Now within the program, we are incentivized to um, manage to the, you know, the rate, the premium that the federal government has provided. And, you know, we can do things like offer additional benefits such as uh, dental, vision, medical, medically tailored meals. We can provide additional kind of uh, supports and services to our members uh, to manage certain um, 
certain health conditions. So it's it, there's incentives within how we are paid to help incentivize this type of value-based uh, or value incentivized care through the, through the product and through the program. But the, the under underlying premium is there, and that that payment to the managed care plans on a member per member basis is largely based on what the federal government would, would have otherwise paid out, if you will, if uh, a member was in traditional Medicare. And then there's the, there's also the Medigap, Medigap or the Medicare supplement market, which, you know, uh, if you're unaware, a lot of patients, a lot of Medicare enrollees might purchase to help fill gaps in coverage that exist in traditional Medicare. So really it's uh, Medicare Advantage is one option through which um, a, a Medicare eligible enrollee uh, can, can access their Medicare benefits. Great, thank you. Did you still have a question? I do. This is very quick. I'm sorry, Jordan, I may have missed this. Is MVP a for-profit company with shareholders or is it not-for-profit? We are not-for-profit, um, no shareholders. So, you know, the way we're organized and structured, we view kind of the community as, the, as our shareholders. And uh, fundamentally what that means is to the extent that we're earning, you know, profits, it's, it's going back into the company and back into supporting innovations and in, 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 in reserves to help pay member claims. So uh, profits are staying local and they're being reinvested in the community and the company. Thank you. Great, thanks Jordan, we can continue. So uh, pivoting just to focus on Vermont, um, some high level points. We've been licensed in Vermont as an HMO since 1993. So we've got a local presence here of more than 25 years. Um, in Vermont, we've got over 40,000 members and I'll, I'll touch a bit more on that number and, and where they kind of reside in terms of uh, coverage markets on the next slide, but primarily those members are concentrated in the individual and small group, the QHP uh, qualified health plan markets. We've got a few thousand fully insured large group members and um, a few thousand Medicare Advantage members as we were just talking about. Um, we've got a comprehensive local network, which includes over 5,000 uh, local providers and is inclusive of the University of Vermont Health Network and Dartmouth-Hitchcock in, in New Hampshire as well. So our Vermont members really have access to a, a really strong regional provider network that includes um, strong, strong provider base in Vermont, but also in, in New York, upstate New York and in New Hampshire as well. And then, uh, you know, as we were just speaking to, uh, as a community-based partner and plan, we really value the local partnership, the partnerships we have within our communities in Vermont, you know, this includes, you know, we've been active participants uh, with One Care Vermont since 2020. Uh, we've been financially and clinically supportive of the Vermont Blueprint for Health um, for, for many years and as I mentioned and, and got into a bit, you know, we've been partnering with UVM Health Advantage since 20, beginning of 2022 to co-create and offer, um, again, a, a, a provider system, physician-led and created a Medicare Advantage plan that really, really strives to understand the local healthcare needs of a Vermont eligible Medicare enrollees. So kind of the vision here is to, to really deliver this, this service and this product at a hyper local level, using data to understand uh, what, what member needs and preferences are and then building products and, and op products and services that really attempt to address those needs. Uh, we have a question, Joe. I just wanna go back to Medicare Advantage again, um, because this has been mentioned a few times. Um, and, uh, in April 2022, uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office of the Inspector General released a report called Some Medicare Advantage Organizations' Denials of Prior Authorization Requests Raise Concerns About Beneficiary Access to Medically Necessary Care. And so I was wondering, um, how have, uh, have you done any sort of internal audits to determine whether uh, MVP's Medicare Advantage programs are um, having the problems that the Office of the Inspector General uh, indicated in that report um, or doing any sort of uh, ongoing internal audits to ensure that beneficiaries are getting the benefits that they would receive if they were under traditional um, uh, traditional uh, Medicare plans? Yes, uh, great question. Um, I saw the report and read the report and we did take a look at some of the findings there and I would say generally speaking some of the concerns or gaps that the OIG um, report uh, found and, and spoke to are not, not things that um, we feel are, are issues for, for MVP and our members. For example, one of the areas they looked at, I think pretty extensively was imaging and we don't prior off any imaging for our Medicare 
uh, members. And that was, I think, a few year, years ago, something we had seen in the member experience data, right, that that was kind of a friction, an, un, an un, unnecessary friction point for our Medicare members. So that's something we work to remove. And I would um, take your question as it relates to the, the partnership of the University of Vermont Health Network. You know, uh, prior authorizations and medical management are something that we are really actively working on together to better understand um, and, and really reduce uh, unnecessary friction for the patient and the member and their access to care where it's where it's appropriate. So that's that's certainly part of kind of the collaborative discussions we're having with the, the network to, to understand from their perspective where medical management is appropriate, where it could be streamlined and, and become more efficient. And then the last point I would add on Medicare Advantage. Um, so in New York State, uh, there's, there's several smaller regional not-for-profit health plans located across uh, upstate New York, providing coverage in different markets. And Medicare Advantage has kind of a long history in, in New York, particularly upstate New York, where it is, um, it is really the, the, the Medicare benefit of choice for most Medicare eligible enrollees. I think in Monroe County, where we have a lot of uh, members in and around the Rochester area, about 80% of Medicare eligible enrollees are in a Medicare Advantage plan instead of a, a supplement or a traditional fee-for-service plan. So we have a long kind of history here and, you know, consistently our Medicare Advantage uh, members are our most satisfied. You know, I can't speak to other companies, but, you know, we, it's an important part of our, our business in, in, in terms of serving the community and, um, and we have very, very satisfied members. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Let's move on. And then we, we do want to stop pretty close to not far after 1030 to give everyone a break. So, so this is uh, the last slide. And, and what I want to do here is just highlight where MVP's members are within all of Vermont's insured landscape. So the green pie chart at the left represents estimated source of coverage for all insured Vermont enrollees. I, I believe this is information that Nolan Langwell spoke to a couple of weeks ago, and it's based on a DIVA access report from January of 2022 in the Vermont uh, Household Health Insurance Survey. But as you can see here, um, the private qualified health plan markets, which is roughly 75,000 people, uh, these are individuals that buy coverage through Vermont Health Connects. They may get a subsidy depending on their income if they're buying in the insurance uh, individual market and it's small group employers as well. 40% uh, of those markets are, uh, in, 40% of those market enrollees are insured through an MVP healthcare plan. So most of our 40,000 members in Vermont are concentrated in you know, these, these markets. And I think why that's important for this committee to understand, again, I think Nolan touched on this, you know, these are heavily regulated, state regulated markets where our rates are approved by the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, you know, licensure, solvency, marketing, and, and other elements of our business are regulated by the Department of Financial Regulation. These are ACA federal law compliant products and they're sold primarily through Vermont Health Connect. So a lot of this committee's work um, certainly has a jurisdiction and an impact on, on these markets. So we have an active interest in uh, your discussions in your work and uh, as well as that of other uh, state Vermont policymakers. And again, we do have uh, about 5% of Medicare enrollees are insured through an MVP healthcare Medicare Advantage plan. And we just have a few thousand fully insured large group members in Vermont. And uh, currently we don't have any self-funded membership. So really the bulk of our membership and our focus is on these private qualified health plan markets. Great, so, thank you very much. Any last question or comment? This is really not a question for Jordan, but thank you. I'm just noting you know, the conversation about um, Medicare Advantage, which is hard and complex. Uh, but we're due a report of Medicare supplemental coverage and Medicare Advantage plans from DFR. I don't think it's done yet, or it's not. It's not. Bad. We can look for it, highlight it. So I was just wondering about that. One. Yeah, I had a question about claims um, because mm -hmm. uh, I know, uh, at least from my personal experience, you know, because I, I have not have MVP as an insurer, so I, I can't speak to yours, which is part of why I'm asking this. Um, but, you know, uh, I look at your mission about improving health and providing peace of mind and creating healthier communities. But I know certainly um, personally and also anecdotal um, things from constituents and friends, um, you know, that so often their doctors tell them something is important. Uh, they need a medication or something like that. Um, and then they enter into a several month odyssey of the doctor trying to get the insurance company to cover the medication, which 
typically ultimately occurs, it just takes a month or more for it to happen. Um, after about this one, this most re recently happened to me because this happened multiple times. Um, and my doctor said, um, you know, the one thing we need is to not be practicing medicine with our hand tied behind our back because we're taking so long, we recommend something and it takes so long to then get the, get the prior off or whatever authorization is needed. And so I'm wondering if you're looking into any ways of expediting those sort of things so patients don't need to wait as long um, to get something that ultimately they're gonna get anyway, at least I have always in my experience, it just ends up taking a month or more to wind its way through denial and then you know peer review and then all these different things until you finally get the medication you need. Is there any way to make that more efficient? Yeah, that's a great question. Is that you know something we as an organization are kind of consistently looking at? I mean, it, it's important for us, for our members to access the right care at the right place at the right time. So I think medical management prior authorization has an important role uh, in our healthcare system. And it, it's not just, um, you know, financial in terms of, you know, maybe di directing uh, care towards the most known clinically effective and cost effective treatment. That's certainly important because affordability is a huge issue, but it's also quality as well, especially, you know, new drugs and treatments. There may be, um, you know, the, the, the science and the, the, the medical community may be, not have the experience with a new drug, for example, to, to really understand what the value add is relative to other treatments that are already out there. So, you know, what I what I can do is take a look at what our average turnaround time is for prior authorization requests. A, a month seems incredibly long to me. I think, you know, we're turning things around much quicker than that. You know, and, and prescription drugs are are a little bit complicated because, because there are so many new high cost blockbuster, what we call uh, you know, biologic drugs that are entering the market that are several hundred thousands of dollars, upwards of a million dollars, uh, you know, a, a treatment. So, you know, those things as an industry, it's something we're kind of always looking at to understand that the value at there and a lot of the the, the formulary management and, and medical management tools there are intended to ensure we're driving members to more uh, known clinically effective and cost effective treatments because prescription drugs are the fastest rising component of healthcare spend and premiums. I was surprised to learn the last couple of years we're spending more on prescription drugs than we are on hospital inpatient services. So that's a pretty market shift in, in the healthcare spend. Um, and, and generally speaking, you know, I fully, we fully agree with kind of your points about friction, unnecessary friction and abrasion. And that's why we're constantly looking at any prior authorization or medical management policies we have in place to, you know, if there's not a, a value add in terms of, um, you know, the member experience and the, the cost effectiveness, then we're looking to remove things that are unnecessary. You know, we're, we're not looking to create undue burden for our provider partners either. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. And Joe, we have several reports coming back to us on prior house, so we'll be taking a look at that. So thank you very much, Claire and Jordan. We appreciate the overview. Um, Again, Claire's in the building, so please reach out for her with questions. And Jordan, thank you for your time. Likewise, any questions that Claire or I can answer, constituent issues, uh, please don't hesitate to, to reach out. We look forward to working with you all in the uh, weeks and months ahead. Great, thank you. Thank you. And for committee, um, please be back in your seats by 10.30.